Welcome to our colloquium this afternoon. I'm Miriam Stark, today's moderator. I want to thank the University of Hawaii at Manoa's Department of Anthropology and our Center for Southeast Asian Studies for co-hosting this talk, which I am managing with the technical assistance of our center GA, Mr. Ariel Mota Alves, who just spoke. It's my distinct pleasure to convene this UHM Anthropology Colloquium by Dr. Heng P. Paul, who earned his PhD in our department in 2018 and is the only Cambodian archaeology student ever to get a Fulbright Award for an MA degree in the United States. Pipal is currently a postdoctoral researcher with Northern Illinois University through a postdoc with the American Council of Learned Societies, Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation for Buddhist Studies. And we co-direct a field project through the University of Sydney's Greater Encore team on an Australian Research Council funded project called Urbanism After Encore, Redefining Collapse. This summer, Dr. Heng Paul will begin his Gerda Henkel Stiftung grant entitled After Encore, Archaeological Perspectives on Urban Change from the 14th through 17th century CE. Our subproject is called Pum Archaeology, which we run in collaboration with APSRA, National Authority in Cambodia, and Cambodia's Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts. But who is Heng Paul? One of Cambodia's most accomplished archaeologists in terms of both field and research experience. He can do field work. Since his first archaeological field training in 2000, Dr. Heng P. Paul has directed 14 archaeological field projects in more than seven of Cambodia's 24 provinces, with current postdoctoral field research in the Siem Reap province, just south of the Angkor Archaeological Park. Heng P. Paul can also do research. He's published uh, since 2012. That was his first book chapter. When he's a PhD student since then, he has authored or co-authored 13 journal articles and book chapters. He's got one journal manuscript in press, three under review, and three book chapters in production. And Heng P. Paul communicates his findings to the broader public. He has made more than 25 public presentations and eight invited lectures in English and in Khmer, not including public outreach on archaeology and heritage to Khmer-speaking audiences as part of his research projects. Heng P. Paul's current research examines organizational transformations that accompanied the adoption of Theravada Buddhism in 15th through 18th century Cambodia. The adoption of Theravada Buddhist, Buddhism across early modern Southeast Asia was the end point of a millennium long relationship with Buddhism in the region. His work, which utilizes archaeological methods to complement a very sparse internal documentary record, is original and important. It's also the next logical piece in his lifelong research on Cambodian history, having spent the last decade investigating pre Angkorian and Angkorian archaeological topics. We'll first hear his presentation, then have time for Q&A, which we ask that you type into the Q&A box, not the chat box. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Heng P. Paul, who today will discuss an archaeology of religious change, community response in 14th through 18th century CE Encore. Hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for coming and good afternoon from Hawaii. So my talk today um, entitled on archaeology of religious change, um, community response in the 14th to 18th century uncle. Um, <clears throat> um, for those of you who doesn't know where, where it is, um, <clears throat> it's a map of Cambodia and Southeast Asia. And uh, my talk today is specifically concentrate on Angkor and Angkor region. So the main point of my talk today is of one, <clears throat> tracking the transition into the early modern period Cambodia um, around 1400 to uh, 1830s through the lens of religious change and community response to changes through times in the um, framework of the long during. By examining spatial and temporal relationship between temple or monastic communities and their surrounding communities. Um, I used Julia Shaw um, two models of religious change or approach to religious change, ritual model and practical or political economic model to investigate religious change. Um, the talk today, I would like to present my preliminary results from our home archaeology phase one field work conducted in January 2019 and um, December 2019 and January 2020. 
from the the um, textual textual records and um, art historical records. Um, we know that there was organizational change occurring in Angkor during the 13th century following the adoption of Theravada Buddhism. Um, <clears throat> that time is characterized by political instability, um, internal rivalries, and conflict with the Yutia. We also noted that, noticed that the construction of large stone monument ceased and there was a shift toward wooden structure uh, dedicated to Theravada Buddhism. So two, model of religious, two models of religious change um, are a ritual model that emphasize religious practices associated with the sacred space um, themselves. The pol political economic model inf infer the relationship between the monastic communities and the surrounding communities. Um, the scholarship on, on the post Angkorian period or the middle uh, period of Cambodia have overwhelmingly um, um, used the, the, the ritual model to understand transformation from the Angkorian period to the, the post Angkorian period. And from what we know so far, there are two continu continuing phases of Theravada uh, propagation in Angkor. One occurring in, during the 13th to 15th century, the late Angkorian period. Um, we have evidence associated with the Buddhist structures, uh, statuaries, and sparse inscriptions. Um, <clears throat> some Angkorian temple, uh, a few were newly built and other were converted to Theravada Buddhism. Um, the te Theravada structures, so-called Buddhist terrace or the, the Vihira Vihara were incorporated into the pre-existing um, Angkorian communities. Another phase it's associated with the 16th to 18th century, beginning with the reinstallation of power base, of Cambodia power base at Angkor by the King Ang Chan and his successors. And this period is characterized by a complete uh, transformation of Angkor and Angkor Wat, especially as an international pilgrimage center. And during this time, we saw the transition um, of, of artistic um, inspiration from the Southern School based at Sri Santo, um, one of the post Angkorian capitals. And we have begun to see a strong Ayutian um, artistic inspiration. So, major uh, transformation occurred at Angkor Wat and Batang Temple. So we, what we know about phase one is that it was coincided with a visit of a, um, a Chinese um, ambassador to Angkor, Chou Daguan, in 1296 to 1297. They report that each village had a temple and uh, it was most likely Buddhist temple. Um, we have Buddhist monumental architectures and sculptures, again, Buddhist terrace, um, Many of them were placed in front of a temple or a stupa. We also know that Brahmanical temples still were still functioning, both state and private temple, and they remain influential. For example, we have uh, the late Angkorian inscriptions at Bagdisre um, reaffirming that the temple is still, is still well functioning. And of course, the last Sanskrit inscription at Bangalata of the 14th century. So these are some example of the Buddhist structure, late Angkorian structure. Um, this one is at the Satatut or Grafi 2X inside Angkor Tom across from the Royal Palace. 
um, the internal wall will carve with these type of Buddha, seated Buddhas, uh, Maravijaya. And to, directly to the east of this temple, to your lower right is the so-called Buddha's terrace, or the Buddha's be here. Um, other features associated with these terraces are the Sima stone or boundary stones commonly occurred in twins, in pair. And rarely a stupa um, like this one. Uh, recently, um, Andrew Harris have, has mapped about 59 Buddhist terraces with Sima stone inside Angkor Thom and 12 uh, Buddhist structures without Sima stone. So these are example of those Buddhist terraces. Um, many of these are uh, uh, being used as a uh, current pagodas. So it's a stone terrace with a seated Buddha to the west and end. And uh, it's a seated Buddha at Deplanam to your left. And on the top are two major terraces, or two major we hear, Tang Tok and we uh, hear from Bulawain inside Angkor Thom. And the lower right is uh, uh, the pagoda of Buddha Sea. You could see a carving here um, on that terrace. It's very similar to the elephant terrace uh, carving. And an inscription found within this, this uh, uh, compound, um, K930, uh, mentioned two Buddha, Srindra, um, Sri Srindra Sukata and Srindra Kailoka Mahata, most likely associated with Indra Varman III or Srindra Varman, uh, reigned between 1298 to 1296 to uh, 1307. So other Buddha statues <clears throat> um, have been found again in Angkor at Devanam to your left. Um, Bapun Temple, the uh, 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 entire Western gallery was transformed into a reclining Buddha with an associate AMS date to the early 15th century, early 15th century. And uh, further to the east, uh, 90 kilometers to the east of Angkor at Rakan to Fongsvai, we have Rajat uh, Mok to your right. South and central Cambodia, uh, pre-Angkorian temple of Trajan had been converted to, uh, to a Theravada pagoda with four standing Buddhas um, carved on it. So here we could see that the tradition, Angkorian tradition of monumental architectures still continue, but has been transformed to accommodate Theravada Buddhism. And we should know that especially the four Buddhas, Krachata Mok to your right, it's a, a reoccurring theme, a theme throughout um, Cambodia in the post Angkorian period. Um, at Angkor Wat itself, when Joda Kwan uh, came to Angkor, he described it as the tomb of, of Lupa. So, he said nothing about pagoda, but we know that by, by the time of the um, Ayutthaya occupation in Angkor, two pagodas were built inside Angkor Wat. And if we look at, at um, uh, an engraving on the pillars in, at the central tavern, you see these two Buddha image that um, um, is similar to the one carved at Vasat, uh, West Vasato with an associate AMS date between 1270 to uh, 1325, something like that. So late 13, early 14th century. And the walking Buddha um, on the stella found out at Angkor Wat also. It's a common um, style 
um, also called Thai, dated between the uh, uh, 13th and 14th century. So there's slight evidence that Angkor Wat itself began to be um, transformed into a Theravada Buddhist pagoda. And phase two uh, dated between the 16th and 18th century. Um, by this point, the Angkorian Angkor political powers already collapsed during the 15th century and the capital and population shifted southward to around Phnom Penh. Uh, from remaining uh, sparse documents, we know that the elite title uh, being used by the post Angkorian um, monarchs and elites alike are very, were very similar to those used in Ayutthaya. Um, we know that monks and the Buddhist communities were influential. We have no evidence of continuing uh, Brahmanical temples. The economy was still primarily agrarian, but um, the, uh, the post Angkorian court, especially, was actively involved um, in the maritime trade network. Um, the epigraphy, however, suggests continuity or transformation from a Brahmanical Sanskrit tradition to the, the uh, Pali and vernacular, vernacular um, language of the Theravada Buddhism. Um, this picture to your right uh, is the central Buddha image. Again, with four Buddha statues, the reoccurring theme of the post Angkorian period that inherit directly from, from the, uh, the Angkorian period. These statues are new, but look at the feet at the bottom made out of stone. Um, reportedly built by Ang Jan. So this period also, we know the complete um, Theravadaization of, of Cambodia, like we see in this case from Wat Nako in Tumpung Cham, along the Mekong River, Jayaoman's seventh uh, temple of Wat Nako was converted and transformed into a stupa um, around 1566. And in the cent uh, central uh, figures, central image, we see again four Buddhas uh, with back facing stupa. And to your right um, is the uh, uh, restored image from an old one that was destroyed during the Khmer Rouge. Um, seated image with four arms. Um, associate possibly with the uh, Brahmanical, earlier Brahmanical tradition that is being transformed or adopted into uh, Theravada Buddhism, associated with the uh, Sri Santo um, art school. And during this time, uh, around the, uh, the uh, first half of the 16th century, the Angolian King Angjan returned to Angkor um, established his power base there. And in 1546, ordered a completion, completion of uh, <clears throat> the bar relief of the Northeastern, Angkor Wat Northeastern galleries. Now, according to uh, 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 Bosavro and um, in the ethnographic studies, of, of um, Julian, the Brahmanical tradition actually survived the, at this date within the elite circles. Uh, for example, the completion of this, of this uh, bell relief were done by, by uh, craftsmen from the royal workshop. Um, Brahmanical gods according to the surviving inscriptions and, and um, chronicles and, and palm leaves manuscript, were incorporated into the upper stratum of the Khmer supernatural worlds, that is the Netta, the, the spirit world. So Shiva and Vishnu are no, no longer associated with the, the um, 
encode in Brahmanical gods, but they were um, the, the uh, highest ranking that uh, Shiva especially became the guru of magic, of, of any kind of craft production of theaters of healing. Um, like you see in this image that is typical um, image of Shiva as chief of, of Rishi or Ese, the hermit with pointed beard, long hair, uh, knotted hair, um, that is still depicted in, in, in Cambodia uh, today. And Vishnu became known by another epithet of Narayana, a uh, border bubble. And uh, both sides will argue that any connotation, any, any uh, reference to Vishnu actually was inspired by Uncle Wat himself. The name of Uncle Wat was uh, Vishnu Loka. During the 16th century, we also had the restoration of, of um, Uncle Wat Central Tower, um, like you see in the central um, image here, central photograph. And the four open doors of the central tower were blocked and carved with Buddha statues. So during this time, um, Angkor Wat was, the central tower was converted and became a stupa with four standing Buddhas in each direction. Um, <clears throat> as Lee Thompson argued that, that this symbolized the, the uh, transformation of Angkor civilization of ancestral worship um, to become four Buddhas and with, with an abstract uh, fifth Buddha to come, uh, the, uh, the uh, fifth Buddha, uh, Maitreya. And in the 17th century, we have the Japanese inscriptions in Angkor. Um, we have the earliest map of Angkor Wat being drawn by the Japanese and reaffirm the idea that Angkor Wat itself and Angkor itself became this international um, pilgrimage center. Um, our previous excavation at Angkor Wat um, inside the Angkor Wat enclosure uh, on habitation mounds confirm these dates that Angkor Wat remained to be inhabited uh, according to this, the uh, AMS dates that we have at least until the 17th century. Now by, by, the, by phase two of the transformation, the whole Cambodians with these dots, these name um, on, on the map, wholly became a Buddhist landscape uh, Buddhist geography, marking by, by uh, post Angkorian ru rulers, reign at Logan. So the, uh, the uh, propagation of Buddhism was now completed. So now, came the, now comes the practical model of the Kuma theology. We know a lot uh, uh, from the ritual models, but how do we track socio political changes? following the adoption of Theravada Buddhism. When did Theravada replace Brahmanism and Mahayana at the local community level? What happened to the local elite temple, local and elite temples? Were they abandoned? Were they all converted? Or what happened to them? And um, the other questions that, that our project is interested in is how did the collapse of Angkor political power being felt by the local communities in the surrounding rural areas? So my research concentrated in the south um, section of Siem Reap, the south of Angkor, uh, around Siem Reap town, and subdivided into three clusters corresponding to uh, Hari Haralaya to your right, Siem Reap town itself, at the center and go by real to, uh, to your left, <clears throat> to the west, excuse me. So the centers, the cluster to the east and the west had pre Angkorian remains that they did as early, as early as the seventh century, seventh and eighth century. 
and the central area of, of Simri town uh, comprised of mainly the 10th century um, uh, temple and later. So with this um, highlight, uh, apologies of, of these clusters, but notice the red dots are potential sites to be investigated. Yellow, the yellow circles contain um, temples and inscriptions dated between the 10th and 11th century, mostly the 10th century, um, associated with the elites, the official from Rajendra Varman and his son, Jayaman V. Um, <clears throat> the red circle to your left is Scopes by Jake with an, an uh, earliest inscription, Pali inscription. Um, I'll watch the earliest Pali inscription actually. So this inscription date to uh, 1308 CE, late Angkorian period that mentioned the earliest constructions of the Buddhist pagoda. So we have the earliest evidence of Theravada outside of the capital city. The blue circles are contemporary pagodas with evidence of Angkorian and late Angkorian remains. So at the center here, we have Wat Lam Nat and Wat Vipramurat, which are the center of modern Simrip town. <clears throat> at both uh, pagodas, Wat Vipramurat, we have this type of Sima stones like those in, in Angkor. Um, we have the uh, uh, lion stone lion guardians in both Wat Lepilomarat and Wat Amnat. And in Wat Lepilomarat, uh, behind the main Buddhas, there is a declining Buddha reportedly made out of stone. The um, um, foundation story associated but with Wat Lepilomarat link it to the king at the way. So it's, it's likely that the foundation of this temple was associated with the return of Ang Chan and, and uh, his successors. So the focus of my talk today is a preliminary results of our phase one um, excavations concentrated to the south portion of the research area and is subdivided into three small clusters surrounding um, Wat Atria to your lower uh, right, Wat Chat Day at the center, and Wat Lai Plau to the top left. I first started with Wat Atria at Tuk Bok where we um, had four one by two meter excavation trenches. So Kokton Pok, these uh, to your left view from Google Earth is a temple mount in red surrounded by four, in this is actually five uh, habitation mounts. So we want to investigate both the temple mounts and the habitation mount to reconstruct its habitation history and the change associated uh, uh, with the, the um, transition into the early modern period. On top of Kokton Pok, we have this uh, spirit house, the Nyata um, house. And there we found two broken pieces of um, uh, colonnades. So that framed the door into a temple made out of pink sandstone. Um, the, the style of this, of this colonnade is very close to the 10th century Bantes Ray, which again make a strong case of a 10th century temple foundation like those yellow circles um, I showed you earlier. And um, <clears throat> we had two trenches on the Temple Mount, and we confirmed that it was a brick structure, brick terrace built atop a, 
Glatterite Foundation. The ceramics that were found from this excavation include um, Khmer stoneware, uh, likely from Phnom Kulin. This one dates slightly later, uh, maybe 12th or 13th century. We have Chinese ceramic um, from Song Dynasty. And we have um, most likely a Ming Dynasty ceramic. So uh, post 15th century. This one uh, is most likely a, a Qing Dynasty ceramic. So we have a long term uh, continuities, um, evidence of occupation in this Temple Mount. But these um, of 12th and 13th century ceramics were found from brick rubbles. So they might associate it with when the structure began to uh, decay and collapse. The habitation mount also, uh, the habitation mount is actually still being occupied. So the date here uh, from these ceramics, we had uh, something like this from uh, Macaung Kiln, like the date to the ninth century. And with the Chinese ceramics, um, we have this, you know, this one, for example, would be the Qing Dynasty, the Yuan Dynasty, 14th century, um, 15th century, and 17th to 18th century. So we have a long term um, occupation, evidence of long term occupation of the uh, habitation mound as well. And uh, the preliminary result pending AMS dates is that we have the 10th century um, construction of the temple uh, with the surrounding habitation mounds. By the 11th and 13th century, uh, these mounds and temple were still being used, but the temple likely collapsed by the 13th, the 12th and 13th century. And at the same time, we see the construction. We also have the construction of what fear to the east. Um, <clears throat> so the point of focus was likely shifted to one or two after this temple uh, collapse. But evidence of continuities, evidence of human activities on this mound suggests that even after Anko political collapse in the 15th century, people still lived here. Um, <clears throat> again, what at fear? Um, stylistically date to the Angkor Wat style, 12th century. But we have the statues that were recovered from what are primarily Buddha statues. None of the Brahmanical uh, statues were found from here. So it, it's, it's likely that when Angkor was transformed into Theravada Buddhism, adopted Theravada Buddhism, what are is also following the same pattern. And the local community simply shift to a new temple. Um, my next um, cluster I, I would like to talk about is what you think. Um, I have to mention this, that these are living communities. The surrounding communities still go to this pagoda or what you think. So um, we had, previous research had identified these mounds to the north um, of Wat Chet Day, and those were where we were interested in. Um, we too, Pirom had done surface collection in this area back in, in um, um, 2012, and had identified a lot of Angkorian and post-Angkorian remains on this mound. So we, we had two excavations here at Gokpa and Gokong, four excavations at Kokoka, two excavations at Gokpre and Pearl East. Notice that these are not temple communities. There's no associated temple features um, within these habitation mounds. So it's most likely that these communities went to watch at the when they were found. Um, similar to Kok Don Tok, uh, <clears throat> this lithography 
and artifacts coming from one of the mounds actually date back as early as the 7th and 8th century with candy spout and red painted um, earthenware. The earliest uh, form of green glazed ceramic um, from Bang Kong or Kulen region date to the 9th century and the later Chinese ceramics here post uh, Ming Dynasty. Again, like don't go on top the, the top um, 60 centimeter of the excavation, those uh, comprise both the post Angkorian period and the Angkorian period ceramics. So the post Angkorian uh, uh, stratigraphy is actually very thin, only about a third of the Angkorian stratigraphy. Um, another mound, Kokroka. Similar patterns, we have a candy spout, 7th to 8th century. Um, then we have um, on the top, your top right here is brown glazed um, ceramics date to the 13th or 14th century, most likely from um, um, kiln next to um, uh, Phnom Kulen. The Chinese ceramics also date from the 12th, 13th century at the center to uh, much recent, let's say the 19th and 20th century. Again, evidence of continuities. Another mound from Kok Triampo, similar patterns. Um, this one, the ceramics that we found there dated from the 9th all the way to uh, the, the 19th century. So evidence of continuities, people still live there. So I sometimes I feel uncomfortable to assign the date to 20th century because people are still living there. But this is what the, <clears throat> the center of these communities. We have the, the Angkorian um, brick temple dated again to the 10th century. But we also have evidence of pre Angkorian uh, features, pre Angkorian um, architectural elements, sorry, uh, of the colonnade here date 7th or 8th century. So the, the architectural style mirror that of the community itself. Um, from what that day is evidence of Jayavarman, um, Buddha surrounded by, by um, Lokeshwara and Panyapamita. Uh, reclining Buddha statues inside the temple. And these Buddha statues uh, that the center made out of stone um, to your right made out of wood date from the late Angkorian period to uh, the 17th century. And they were collected uh, and stored at Angkor Conservation because there were multiple robberies in the 80s and 90s. So what we learned from the Chedai, what Chedai cluster is that we have phase one period um, evidence of the earliest occupation of the wetland uh, <clears throat> where the, the flood from the Tony Sap reach um, dated to the seventh and eighth century. Then we have continued evidence of residential activities of the ninth and 10th century and, uh, and uh, all the way to the, the uh, uh, present. But again, the post Angkorian period strata are very thin and only concentrated at the top 30, 40 centimeter. My last um, cluster that, that um, uh, uh, we excavated is at Wat Lai Padau, again, a local communities. And similar pattern, um, ninth century earliest occupation to, to uh, 18th, 19th century ceramics. So in conclusion, the political economic model complements the ritual model uh, I talked about earlier, and it suggests a gradual transformation from the, the Angkorian period to the modern period. 
there is no evidence associated with drastic change following the Theravada conversion, no evidence of, of, um, of abandonment of settlements associated with the collapse. And our issues here is that the post onkorian strata are only thinly uh, concentrated in the top, top um, 30 to 80 centimeters, similar to those observed by Martin Falkenhorn and colleagues working down south in Lowe and Sri Santo. I thank these individuals and this organization for supporting my research and thank you for listening. Thank you very much for this great talk. Um, I would like to open the room for discussions now. I guess I'm opening the Q&A box. Uh, and I wanted to first uh, start by saying it's really interesting and very hard to do this post inquiry in archaeology. That much is obvious. Um, but I wondered if you might be willing to tell us a little bit about uh, how you think community organization would change with the shift to Theravada Buddhism broadly. So you've worked in one area, and perhaps you could talk about the trends uh, in the same region. I'm sorry, is that a question for me? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Let me. Uh... So, in the same region, um... let me go back to it now. Do you have a specific site in mind? No, I just or wondered just if like... you would talk generally about the pattern. Um, let me find a site. Sorry. So this is a map of Siem Reap. Um, <clears throat> the data for Siem Reap town to south of Siem Reap, it's, it's actually quite incomplete. But from what we have is that, according to the inscription, the earliest occupation came from the, the east cluster of Bakong or Hariharalaya and the west cluster surrounding Ot Yom. So <clears throat> these two distant uh, uh, clusters. And actually, according to the inscription, both were called, to the east, it was called Hari Haralaya. The west is uh, Hari Harapura. So both dedicated to uh, Hari Hara. And from what we know from the inscriptions in yellow is that most of these inscriptions were dedicated to Vishnu except this one right here. Uh, inside Simriap town, the central cluster, especially around Watamna, we don't have a lot of, of um, Angkorian um, sites within most likely, it has to do with the Angkor Wat Canal, so changing um, direction or changing course of the Angkor Wat Canal. First, it ran here to the west of Simlip. So we see that a lot of the sites are concentrated there. And then the Simlip River came um, post 12th century when Uncle Wat River, the, the, the Simlip River changed its coast or canal, actually. Then it ran through Simlip Town. And Wat Atria was built on top of that course. So then we could the pattern that we could see is that inside Siem Reap town, um, beside uh, what I'm going to say, the 10th century in, uh, 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 temple, there were not a lot of Angkorian occupations, but the post Angkorian occupation, um, but the thing changed in the post Angkorian period when we had what of that and what did Lumra and with the reinstallation of Angkor by Ang Chan and his successors. The two clusters to the east and west, um, the clusters, the habitation still remain the same according to the data that we have now. So they, they were um, stable communities 
um, continuing occupying the area um, had access to uh, the wetland, to wet rice agricultures since at least the seventh century uh, until the, the present. So my, my, what, what I could talk about now is just that there are these stable communities that remain unaffected by the political, uncle political collapse. But the one that affects the most is Seaview Town because the formation of Seaview Town seems to coincide with, with the uh, post 16th century reinstallation of uncle, possibly with the, uh, when, when uncle began, itself began to be populated and population shift south into Seaview Town. That's all I could say for now. That's great. Thanks. Uh, an audience member has asked about the stone to wood. I was going to ask about um, what Madeleine Gito noted uh, back in 1975 in her magisterial study of post Angkorian art, where she said that wood became a really important source of raw material for statues uh, and then the audience member is asking, why did wood become so important for structures too? So why do we see the shift? And, and to what extent do you think that's affecting the visibility of the post Angkorian period for us? Um, <clears throat> wood, but in the, so the, the theory had to do with uh, the Buddhist um, orthodox idea of, of impermanence, that wood is impermanent and came to the stone, that's one of them. But also if, if we look at um, sparse um, chronicle evidence that talk about the, the, uh, the Buddha sculpture, the, the fashion of a Buddha statues, I think there are two. So the wood, what part of wood, where wood came from, that's one of them. For example, the, um, the Buddha at Wat Gang in the middle of the lake, the four Buddha, was actually a composite. At the bottom is stone feet, the top had wood, but from the, the chronicle, they talk about where the wood came from, what kind of spirits, spirits associated with the wood. Um, <clears throat> so um, why wood in general? Personally, I'm not sure, but <laughs> it has, I have to emphasize that stone statues, Buddha stone statues, inside Anko was actually quite common. So it's, I mean, in terms of investment, time investment, but might take a shorter time um, to make, especially, um, this is my guess, but the inscriptions of the 16th and 17th century, when people went to, uh, um, to uncle, to uncle what especially, they donated Buddha statues. So the period, the time that they spend is uh, uh, relatively short. If you don't know where the, where the uh, uh, workshop of those statues was, but if the and officials from say Lovek or Dong went to uncle, um, how much time did they stay there? Right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, at the time it take to complete stone statues was this time it take to complete the wooden statue would be very different. And the amount that they can afford also. So they want to say 40 Buddhas or 100 Buddhas, for example, like that, that take less time to complete. That just might take on. Well, it's kind of interesting to think that maybe what you lose are the artisan workshops. I hadn't really thought about that, but maybe you lose all of the ateliers so that instead of having these stone statuary that are spread all over the kingdom, you actually have them concentrated in this very important ritual and pilgrimage center, which is on court, but not so many other places. Yes. Um, but I also the, noticed that the uh, completion of the, uh, the bar leaf and Angkor Wat took, um, so 1546 to uh, 1564, I can't remember the date anymore, but around 20 years to complete the two panels. Mm -hmm. So they, they, uh, uh, the atelier, the, the art school working on stone, is, they became less familiar with the mm -hmm. stone materials. Mm -hmm. They became more familiar with the wooden materials. This according to uh, Martin Polkinghorne, 
the type of chisel that they use were also different. The post Angkorian chisel generally flat compared to the round chisel of the Angkorian uh, workshop. So the tradition shifted. I just had to add that the audience member asked whether there is any relationship to deforestation. I know you can't answer it yet, but to give credit to the audience member, there's that. Um, I have two more questions here. Um, let's see. This is a very interesting study. And as a lay person, the excavation work really impresses me. However, around 2000, Dr. Michael Coe said excavation work at Angkor was 50 years behind that done for Mesoamerica or the Maya civilization. I wonder where we are now in this line of work. Uh, good agree. question. <laughs> that was from Buti Chow. Yeah. Uh, yes. And also, so the credit of this period actually goes to Bekna Philip Gouye when he translated um, the, the uh, Spanish and Portuguese Italian uncle. In his book, um, he said that in uncle there was practically no archaeology, and that was the late 50s. And uh, so from then until now, um, we, depending on how you argue, depending on the, the uh, tradition, the academic tradition you're associated with, um, the type of excavation is different. Like we have a lot more archeological excavation in Angkor now, but um, that's why in this talk, I want to emphasize the two models. One to talk about ritual models. So the excavation exists there, but the purpose of the excavation is has to do with the ritual space, the use of ritual space, and then um, associate that with specific events. So with the, the so-called Ecole uh, Evon Deva, the different echo, whereas we, meaning me and <laughs> my colleagues, we look at political economy in a long-term perspective, in the long durée. So we look at, at um, specifically at how people use the space, um, how artifacts being consumed, how they change the landscape uh, through, through times, not just looking at one specific event, but through times, meaning that, that um, um, we could talk about local people, we could talk about the communities that, that uh, the inscriptions were not the focus of the inscriptions. But back to uh, the question of archaeological research in Angkor, I think it's, it's, it's um, we have done a lot more um, than it used to be. It's just that uh, people need time to publish more um, <laughs> and of the, uh, the results of their fieldwork. Thanks. One more question. This is from Shinta Lee. And Shinta says, I wonder what are the main findings from 7th to 10th century CE? Thank you very much. So really interested in the pre ankorian to early Angkorian occupation. If you could just talk a, a tiny bit about the Angkor area and the evidence we have. Thank you for your question. I'm also interested in the pre ankorian um, occupation of this region. Actually, pre ankorian period, you could post that as early as the so-called uh, Bronze Age period. Um, the excavation at the center of the West Barai, is prehistoric remains dating uh, back to, uh, if I recollect the date properly, like a thousand uh, BCE, that's quite early. And um, um, a, 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 another pro proto-historic uh, site um, of Lake Main, which is just right here to the west of the, the uh, West Barai, um, within the, the, the uh, uh, late first millennium uh, BCE, so uh, between 500 and, and BCE and 300 CE, maybe something like that. And then we have Opium which is a uh, pre um, at which was at the center of a pre uh, uh 
habitation or large settlements. I'm trying not to talk about capital city, but <laughs> but we have large pre-Angkorian occupation around Oyun and Wat Khanat. We have pre-Angkorian occupation around uh, Bakong, Atari Haroraya. So it's just in the sense that the pre-Angkorian uh, use of space was actually limited to the wetland. We have a few country, a few evidence of of pre-Angkorian potteries in our excavation. Um, which is not surprising. It's just that the our um, excavation is actually quite thin to talk about um, the pre in space spreading across um, these the southern section. Of Sibir. We need more time and, of course, more funding. All right, we're running out of time. Speaking of time, so I think we'd better wrap it up. But I want. Oh, sorry. I see one more question. All right, uh, here's one more. Sorry, from Mari Koshimoda. Thank you for your lecture about really interesting research. Is there any architectural transformation at temples in the area between the central Angkor area and Tonle Sap? Or do you only find Theravada monuments such as Buddhist terraces in Angkor Thom? So I think the question is, is it, uh, do you see it widely distributed, this kind of transformation, or does it mostly happen in Angkor Thom? Um. <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to think and associate that with the, with the uh, uh, two phases of, of Theravada um, Buddhism in, in, in this area. So in Angkor, we have two, about 13 to 15th century, uh, that was phase one. And we also have phase one at Gok's Vajik here, according to the inscriptions. We don't have any material remains associated with that pagoda. Um, but it seems that to what, what I know now, it seems that um, major transformation of Theravada Buddhism came slightly later in the second phase. That's what we know more about. Uh, that's what the evidence that we have now. But when I worked at Wat Thuyer, my suspicion was that um, it's what well, Atria was made using an archaic style, meaning that at some point, and this is totally my, my speculation, in, in the 13th and 14th century, um, with Theravada Buddhism sticking with Angkor Wat, Angkor Wat style became their style. So, statuaries and, and temple like like Pirapito or Bali Lai supposedly dated to the Angkor Wat style in the 12th century. It's actually a later uh, uh, period um, temple of, of, of uh, Theravada Buddhism, but not just the 13th, 14th century, like we, we saw even in phase two, everything centered around Angkor Wat. It's the inspiration of the artistic tradition of the uh, of the symbolism of power of meaning stick with Angkor Wat. So um, I would argue that based on what we know now that what Atria could have been a Theravada uh, temple since the beginning, there's no, no evidence of grammatical um, association from there at all. So <clears throat> the, the transformation occurred from what we know now, at the same time as as Angkor, to until Theravada Buddhism, it's just that we have more evidence associated with this, the uh, second phase in the 16th century. Like what I clearly have uh, um, early uh, 17th century inscriptions with with uh, the the uh, uh, epigraphic style the. Um, title of the monks very similar to those recorded in Angkor Wat. So we just have these two poles, one in Angkor Wat and one down in Wat Thuyer. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, other other um, temple, I'm not I'm not quite sure. But at Wat Chet, the the transformation of the tower occurred later, most likely um, late 19th, early 20th century. So it's not transforming a temple to become a, a stupa like they did in uh, at, at Wanako. 
Thanks. Now this has to be our last question. I know people are warming to the subject. I think it's great. Uh, but this question is very interesting. So good to end on by Aiksai Go, who says, I am very new to Encore Studies. So please forgive my question. It's a very good question. You mentioned that the Brahmanical tradition survived within the elite. This may imply that Theravada Buddhism was popular with the masses, but that the ruling class only tolerated its existence. Could you talk a bit more about the religious relationship between Cambodians and a elites and the populace in the post Angkorian period, I suppose? Um, that's a, yeah, that is a very good question. <clears throat> so Brahmanical tradition never fades. It still exists in, in, in Cambodia. Um, let me start with the Gok Swajik inscription here, the date 1308. So the king, Srindra Varman, commissioned a construction pagoda. And as part of that, it's a common uh, Khmer tradition by now, starting since the, the pre Angkorian period, that you endow the temple, new temple with land. Uh, with its resources, like rice, um, with its workforce that sometimes we call slave, so tem temple uh, servants. The Buddhist pagodas of the post post Angkorian period were no exception. They own they own um, uh, temple workforce, temple slave called Bolbrea, and uh, that's a later period, but we, we, we know of that since the scopes white inscriptions. And part of this inscription is the transferring of or exchange of a communities that used to serve uh, a, 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 a Shaivite temple. The Suvarna Linga, that was the name of another temple that the king ordered land to be exchanged, lands and resources to be exchanged. So in a sense, a community living in that land now serve the Buddhist pagoda, not the Shaiva temple anymore. But other commu community was still more around and exchange, right? So that what that means is that the lower stratum, um, especially if they were, if they work for the temple, they just move, move along with the temple, with the, uh, with the elites, that's one, that's one case. Another case that um, we have evidence that the uh, uh, Brahmanical tradition associated with the elite. We have the court Brahmins, we have the uh, um, <clears throat> uh, poems being composed mostly by the elites that talk about Shiva, that talk about other Brahmanical gods. But even though their identity persists, as Shiva, as Narayana, as Ganesha, their personality changed. Their personality, like Rama or Ramayana or Riemke and Tma, is no longer this, this central human being, this central god or, or uh, uh, avatar or Vishnu. They became very serene in, in a Theravada Buddhist sense. The Khmer Riemke, the Khmer Ramayana, the storyline of, of Rama and his wife and his, his um, brother being ex exiled in the forest. It's imitate the, the journey of the Buddha. That's what, the, that's what uh, Bodhisattva will argue. So Ramayana itself, Rama was both avatar of, of Vishnu and a Bodhisattva. So we see this, this conversion of, of the story of the character, the Brahmanical character himself. And um, um, who else? Ganesha. Ganesha was still being worshipped um, as the Netta or as amulet. Actually, my, my, um, my grandfather had an amulet of, of, uh, of Ganesha. And it's just a personal example, but it's actually quite common across Cambodia. So this, this, even though major gods survive within the elite circle, other Brahmanical gods are now considered the spirit a part as part of the supernatural world, right? And uh, 
Shiva hold a, a, a different um, place in, in the Khmer supernatural world because among the elite uh, or commoners, or like especially commoners who know how to heal, commoners who, uh, who belong to um, a theater, who belong to a band of traditional music, they start their performance with, with a, a, a dedication to Shiva, praying for Shiva, the ultimate guru of, of this art form to help them perform. So in, in a sense, while the elite, elite circle uh, left the inscriptions that talked about all these Brahmanical gods, we could use an ethnographic studies um, to shed light into the surviving um, Brahmanical gods among the local communities themselves. I hope this answers your question. <laughs> That's a great way to end this very interesting talk. I wanted to once more thank the Department of Anthropology, Center for Southeast Asian Studies, and of course, Dr. Heng Pi Paul. Thank you everyone for coming to our talk. We hope that we can see you in person sometime soon. Stay safe, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone. <laughs>